I'm excited. I'm delighted to be here. I want to share this word with you. The Lord has shared it with me, put it into my heart and into my spirit. And if it blesses you like it blessed me, oh my God, we're in for a great time in the Lord. I want you to go to the 16th chapter of the book of Genesis, verse number 4 through 15. The 16th chapter of the book of Genesis, verse number 4 through 15. And there we're going to read a very fairly familiar passage of Scripture, but I believe God's got some things in it that will bless your life and cause you to grow and go into the next dimension. I'll give you a moment to find it. I don't want you to be left out of it. I want you to have a relationship with your Bible. I don't want you to just watch Sunday morning services and not get your Bible and not get involved and not take notes. I want you to have a relationship with your Bible so that you can grow. This is not an entertainment service. This is a worship experience. So get your Bible right now and go to Genesis 16, 4 through 15, so you can grow in your understanding of God's word. And it starts like this. And he went in unto Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her, her mistress was despised. Catch this closely. Her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarah said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between me and thee. But Abram said unto Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. And the angel of the Lord found her. Oh God, won't he do it? And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way of Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence camest thou? And whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return, return, return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her hand. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. Say that with me. Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me, my God. Wherefore the well was called Be'er Laharoi. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bare Abram a son, and Abram called his son's name, which Hagar bare Ishmael. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. She said, Behold, my God seeth me. Uh, in the original languages, El Roy, he, El Roy, he, El Roy, he, my God sees me. God sees you today. I want you to get that in your spirit. Say, God sees me. Say it again, God sees me. Let's pray right now in the name of Jesus for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to come into this place and to anoint these lips of clay that I might be endowed with the kind of power that makes it possible for ministry to reach the hearts and the souls of men. 
My God, in the name of Jesus, I approach thy throne knowing that you are able to do anything but fail. I believe you for supernatural miracles and to get the glory out of the word of God while it's being preached today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Somebody who believes him, shout amen. amen. Say amen again. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. One of the first things we teach our children when we take them out in public and we see somebody who's physically infirmed or incapacitated, or you see somebody who has uh, some sort of mental issue, uh, we tell our children, don't stare, don't stare, don't stare at him, don't stare at him. After a while, don't stare grows up into don't see. And after a while, people who have problems or issues or are in any way different from us, we have a tendency to erase them mentally from our mind and play as if we don't see what we do see. It's interesting to notice during the pandemic, all of a sudden the word first responder changed its meaning. A few years ago, a first responder was a fireman or a police officer based on 9-11, and we celebrated and we hailed them as first responders, and rightfully so, we should have, because they were heroic and did amazing deeds. But up under this current pandemic, the word changed its meaning, first responder, to start acknowledging people that had been invisible to us, people who drive us, people who deliver packages to us, people who kept working in the grocery stores, people who put themselves in harm's way to make sure that our needs were met. And all of a sudden we were clapping for them and we were honoring them and we were singing songs to them and we were acknowledging them and we became aware of their importance and their significance. And we recognized that without them doing what they do, we could not do what we do. And they became important in that moment. But up until then, they had been invisible. Nobody clap for the girl at the checkout counter. Nobody clap for the guy who put your groceries in the bag. Nobody clap for the person who brought a sandwich by the house. Nobody clap for the pizza man or honored him or recognized him or appreciated him because they were, they tended to be invisible to us. When I talk to homeless people throughout the years of our ministry to homeless people, they say one of the most difficult things about being homeless is that you cease to be a person that you're standing there in need and people are driving by you as if you are a different species altogether. They look and they look away. They try to ignore you. They don't see you. And they don't recognize that there but for the grace of God, it could be them. They don't seem to recognize that at one time that person could have worked at a store or worked at a bank or been somebody's father or been somebody's mother, may still be somebody's mother, somebody's father, but they become invisible because we like to see people who are different from us as, as others and thereby invisible, and it absolves us of the responsibility to care for them. I want you to think about that today. I want you to think, if we can understand, though it's not a good thing, we can understand how people can become invisible that we don't know. And unfortunately, sometimes we take people for granted and we don't really see them. But we also realize that people can be in your own house and become invisible. When you think about Jacob and you think about Leah and he thought he was working 14 years to get Rachel, seven years to get Rachel, and then seven more years uh, to, to only to be given Leah in place of Rachel. And he found himself in a situation where he went in and spent the night with her and didn't know that it wasn't Rachel till in the morning. And my mind just, just, just is boggled at the concept. How could you spend all night with somebody, be intimate with them, be close to them, hold them, hold them in your arms, go to sleep with them, and still not know who they are? That is the worst kind of blindness, the worst kind of invisible, where you objectionalize an individual and you don't see them as a person. The Bible says in the morning, he said, behold, it is Leah. He didn't even know who he was with. So many of us live in situations where we work with people who don't see us. We're married to people who don't see us. We birth people who don't see us. We have parents who don't see us. We go to churches where they don't see us. 
and we live in this invisible pseudo reality that God is getting ready to switch around and do some amazing things and bring you to the forefront. Don't be shy. There's going to be some clapping going on. There's going to be some shouting out the windows. There's going to be banging on some pots saying, we appreciate you because all of a sudden the invisible are about to become visible. Now, it is easy to preach about Abram. He is the father of faith. Out of his loins comes five different major religions. Three of the most prominent religions in the world today all claim their uh, parentage, their patriarchal alliance to Abram himself. Abram is an important character in the Bible. He defines faith for us. He is called the father of faith. He is, he is a believer. He has believed God and it's been counted unto him as righteousness. If there were no Abraham, there would have been no Jesus birthed into the earth realm. If there were no Abraham, there would be no Isaac. If, were, if there were no Abraham, there wouldn't be a Israel. If there were no Abraham, there wouldn't have been the 12 tribes of Israel. Abraham is a significant character. The children of Israel would have died enslaved in Egypt had it not been for a promise that God made to Abraham. We know that Abraham is important. We also recognize that his wife, Sarai, later called Sarah, is also very, very important. She is listed in the hallmark of faith. She believed God and it was counted unto her as righteousness. She believed God and conceived a child when she was past childbearing age because she judged him faithful who had promised. And we know that she's important. She becomes the first lady of faith. She becomes the matriarch of truth. She becomes the one through whose womb the power of God came forth and delivered a child. And that child became so significant because it was a miraculous child. We understand the power of God, especially considering that Sarai was barren. Especially considering that by the time she had a child, she was past childbearing age. Especially considering the fact that by the time she had a child, Abraham's body had become impotent. And yet God, in a swoop of divine order, overcame all three obstacles and manifested himself in the life of his people. What a mighty God we serve. All the odds can be against you. And if God gets ready to bless you, he'll bless you anyway. There can be evidence stacked up against you. It can be true. It can be real. It can be right. It can make sense. It can be scientific. It can be biological. It can be in order. But when God gets ready to move, he can move. The accountant can show you the numbers. The numbers can look horrific. The accountant didn't lie. The business is in shambles. But when God gets ready to move, he he can move. The doctor can show you the x-ray. The x-ray can show you the tumor. The tumor is there. The x-ray is not lying. But when God gets ready to move, he can move. It can be too late in your life, the wrong time, the wrong season, the wrong city, the wrong place, the wrong people, the wrong partner, the wrong relationship. But when God gets ready to move, he can move. You don't always have to move for God to move. You can stand right where you are and God can move right where you are. You can be in the wilderness and God can bring the bread to you. You can be in the wilderness and God can bring water right out of a rock. You can be in the wilderness and God can heal you without a hospital. What a mighty God we serve that's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we may ask or think. He's just able. He's just able. That's why we praise him. That's why we serve him. That's why you're watching this broadcast. That's why I'm preaching this word, because he's able. I'm not preaching this word because I'm religious. I'm not preaching this word because I'm supposed to. I'm not preaching this word because it's my job. I'm preaching this word because it's powerful. It's sharp. It's quick. It's life-changing. It strengthens us. It heals us. It delivers us. And Abraham and Sarah become a picture of faith and agreement. And Abraham and Sarah become become a picture of the power of God. It makes sense that we would talk about them. It makes sense that we would talk about their accomplishment. It makes sense that we would talk about what they did with their lives and how they became the progenitors of a generation of people that were blessed in the earth 
favored of God, anointed of the Holy Spirit. It makes sense that we would talk about them, but that is not my assignment today. I am going to talk about them later, but that's not my assignment today. My assignment is not to espouse the virtues of those whose virtuism is obvious and opulent and right before us, and we can see it, and it's there to behold and to enjoy the splendor of who they are in the Bible. My assignment is not to talk about the major characters, but to talk about a minor character, a minor character named Hagar. She is not in the hallmark of faith. She is not extolled as a woman of virtue and power. She is not a woman that is recognized. She is not a woman who wrote a book of the Bible. She is not a woman who sang songs unto God. She is not a woman of influence and power. She is not a woman of authority. She is not a rich woman. She is not a prominent woman. She is not a woman educated with a lot of degrees and intellectualism. She is not a woman that people got up for when she walked in the room. She is not a woman that you held a chair open for and allowed her to have a seat. You see, Hagar is a slave. She's a slave. We're not, we're not quite clear where Abraham and Sarah picked her up. Some say they picked her up while they were in Egypt. We're not totally clear about it. But somewhere along the journey, they have bought this woman. And in buying her, they have brought her into a situation where she is serving in the house in a state of invisibility. She is serving in the house in a state of not being recognized, of not having any significance. She would have never even made the Bible if it were not for Sarai being barren in her womb. And one day Sarai is up thinking and saying, how can I give Abraham a child? I don't have a child. I can't produce a child. I'm I'm barren. I can't do this. What can I do to give him a child? And she decides to give, check this out, to give Hagar to Abraham for the purpose of producing a child. Wait, you didn't hear that. She didn't meet with Hagar and say, Hagar, how do you like my husband? She didn't meet with Hagar and get Hagar's opinion about the decision. She didn't meet with Hagar and talk to her about the possibilities of being a surrogate mother. They didn't go down to the courthouse and sign papers. They didn't come into any kind of agreement because Hagar didn't have the power to make a decision. When you get in a position of not being able to control your own destiny, not being able to control your own outcomes, not being able to choose your assignments, you're a slave. Whether you down picking cotton or not, you're still a slave. Anytime you can't decide for yourself what is about to happen next in your life, you are in enslavement. That's why I don't let nobody make me a slave. I don't let nobody control me. I don't let anybody tell me what I can and cannot say. I don't care how many people, how many trolls come out on social media and attack me. I got just as much right to have my opinion as you do to have yours. And I am apt to say something back to you because I'm a grown man. You have to understand the power of being able to control your own destiny. And we're living in a time today that people want to control what you think. And if you don't think what they think, they want to shut you up. But I refuse to be a slave. Before I be a slave, I'd be dead and in my grave because a slave is anybody who has lost their power, lost their control, can't make their own decisions, can't control their outcomes, can't control their assignment. This woman had to sleep with a man whether she wanted to or not because she was a slave. It was not her idea. It was not even Abram's idea. Sarah didn't meet with Abram and say, do you think she's cute? Do you want to be with her? Does she look like somebody you'd like to have a child with? No, Sarah makes a decision that sets on course a, a sequence of events that are chaotic and life-threatening and dangerous and problematic and she finds herself in a situation wait, you didn't hear me. The devil didn't do it. 
The demons didn't do it. Satan didn't do it. Hell didn't do it. Haters didn't do it. Sarai does this to herself. So many of us are in trouble right now through the choices we made. We want to blame everybody. We want to accuse everybody. We want to criticize everybody. We want to cast the blame back generations. Well, if it hadn't been for my mother, if it hadn't been for my grandma, no, sooner or later, you have to take responsibility for your own decisions and say, I picked this. I chose this. I went this way. I went that way. Sarah finds herself in a situation where she has tossed this woman into her husband's bed. And you know what's going to happen. She put the woman in her husband's bed and all of a sudden, uh, Hagar begins to change. One of the quick signs of an inappropriate relationship is when somebody starts getting changing in their attitude. They get cocky walking around the house. I'll make up the bed when I feel like it. I'll change the dishes when I feel, wait, 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 wait. Where is this sense of entitlement coming from? Where is this power coming from that all of a sudden something has changed that you're walking around telling me what you are and are not going to do? The strange thing about it is when I used to read the text about Sarai and Hagar. I thought Sarai attacked Hagar, but no, that's not the case. Hagar attacked Sarai. Oh, you don't hear what I'm saying. Put my scripture back on the board. I want to go back to this scripture because I want you to see this because it's utterly amazing. Put the text back up on the board because I want them to understand. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children, and she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. Come on. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her, that I may obtain children by her. Listen, that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised. Wait, 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 wait. When she saw, when Hagar saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eye. Wait a minute, I gotta stop right there. I get upset with people who get upset with me. How do you get to be upset with me and you the one owe me the money? Have you ever seen these people where you loan them the money, they don't pay you back now, they got an attitude because, because you want your money back. This, this is completely out of order. If anybody's supposed to be mad, it ought to be Sarai getting upset with Hagar. But no, Hagar has now despised her own miss. What's up with this girl that now she's walking around rolling her eyes at her mistress? because she's been laying in the bed with her mistress man. I'm not going to get too deep into that because y'all can't handle that kind of stuff. But watch people when their attitudes change. Watch people when they start acting out of order, out of place. Watch people when they do role reversals and you can't figure out what they're upset about and what they have an attitude about and why they're feeling the way they're feeling. This is already a sign that things have gotten out of order. This is already a sign that things are out of control. Disrespect is a sign that she has gotten outside of her place, outside of where she was supposed to be, outside of the boundary. See, once you break down a boundary, you can't control the outcome. Once you tear down the wall, you can't control who climbs across the rubble. That's why we have boundaries in our lives. That's why we say this goes over here and that goes over there. One of the signs of divine order is to have boundaries. You don't come past this point. But now this girl is walking around the house with her nose stuck up in the air and she has despised her mistress. She has despised. Now she's sleeping with her mistress husband at her mistress request and now that she has conceived and done something that her mistress couldn't do, now she is angry at her mistress. I want you to understand this and as the tension 
begins to mount between these two women. And you ain't seen no tension till you've seen tension between two women. I'd rather see tension between two rattlesnakes. I'd rather see two lions fight in the jungle than to see tension between two women becomes a contentious situation. It's terrible to be a man caught between two angry women. Oh, y'all not going to talk to me. Y'all not going to say nothing back to me. It's a horrible feeling to have to hear both of them talking about the other one. You don't know what she did. Did you see how she looked at me? You don't know what she said to me. You don't know so and so. Look at her standing over there. Think she's something. And Abram is like many men today. They are, he is caught between two women who don't like each other. And it doesn't have to be a mistress and a wife. That, uh, that, that, a mistress and a girlfriend. That makes all kinds of sense in the world. It doesn't have to be the wife and the girlfriend. It could be a wife and a mother-in-law. Oh, you can't say nothing because you're sitting right beside one of them right now and you can't say anything. But every time you ride home in the car, there's a whole conversation about her talking about your mother. Then when you go over to your mother's house, your mother says, I can't believe you married that girl. Have you ever been a guy caught between two angry women? Such is the atmosphere in the text right now. Such is the feeling in the house. It's terrible to come home to a contentious house. I could, I'd rather work a contentious job. I'd rather go to a contentious church. I'd rather live in a contentious neighborhood than to come home and have, it's one thing to have hell in the street. It's another thing to have hell in your house. It's another thing to have hell in the place where you got to sleep and you can't rest because there's an atmosphere of antagonism. That is the feeling of the text. The text is charged with the energy of two women at war. I'd rather see two nations at war. I'd rather see two great nations get into a fight than two women get into a fight. You don't know where it's going. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know who's telling you the truth. Both of them are, are venting by verbalizing, but you're standing in between the two of them trying to figure out which way to go. And finally, the decision is made. It gets so bad. It gets so bad that Abram finally says to Sarai, she's in your hand. Wait, wait, wait. Sarai gave her to Abram. Now Abram is so tired of the bickering, he turns around and gives her back to Sarai. Good God Almighty. Sarai has given her to Abram. But now the contention between the women has become so critical that Abram now takes Hagar and turns her over to Sarai. And there's nothing like being turned over to somebody who's angry. To be turned over to somebody who's angry and you don't have any power and you don't have any influence. And I, I have to take a minute and say, Hagar, you brought this on yourself. You brought this on yourself. You were the one who threw the first punch. You were the one who started this argument. You were the one who had the attitude. You forgot your place. You got out of order. You got out of hand. You brought this on yourself. You start, don't start a war where you're outgunned. Don't start a war where you don't have the power. Don't start a war where you're not in a position to have a war. Don't start the war if you can't end the war. And now, Sarai has said to Hagar, get out. Get your nappy head and get out of here. Take your stuff and go. Grab your bag and hit the street. Hit the road, Jack, and don't you come back no more. She's made a decision to put Hagar out, and Hagar is now fleeing. She's fleeing, from, not from Abram. She's fleeing from Sarai. She's running from a woman. And don't you think that it's only women that run from women? There are men who run from women too. Elijah ran from Jezebel. Joseph ran from Potiphar's wife. There's a lot of, when, when a woman gets angry, sometimes all you can do is run. She fled from Sarai. There's nothing like the contention of a woman with power. And all of a sudden, Hagar is on the run. Where are you running? I don't know where I'm going. I don't know where I'm going stay. I don't know what I'm, where I'm going to live. I don't know what I'm going to do. All I know is I got to get away from that woman. And she ran as far as she could run. She ran where Sarai could not reach her. 
She ran where Sarai could no longer mistreat her. The Bible says Sarai had treated her badly. She had treated her badly. I want to stop right here and tell you, be careful what you do with power. There's nothing you have to be any more careful about than what you do with power. When God gives you power over somebody else's future and destiny, you have to be careful how you execute power. You can't execute that power in your flesh because God will judge you for executing that power in your flesh. You have to have discipline. You have to have constraint. You have to have control. Why? Because to him whom much is given, much is required. If God gave you much power, much is required of you. You can't let people get in your ear and say, girl, if I was you, I would do it this way. Man, if I was you, I wouldn't take this stuff. When you got power, you got to be careful about how you make decisions. Sarai had dealt harshly with this woman, and all the woman had done in the first place was obeyed her mistress. But once she obeyed her mistress, you couldn't control what that did. You wanted to control what she did with her body, but you couldn't control what it did with her attitude. Uh, we're going to get into this. We're going to get into this word. See, that's the unpredictable part about relationship. You know what you want to happen, but you can't control how that's going to affect the other person. I'm talking to somebody. I don't even know who it is. You know what you had in mind. You want to get the part that you want and leave the part that you don't want, but there's always cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect. And so all of a sudden, if you do the cause, there's going to be an effect. I said if you do the cause there's going to be an effect. If you come in the office any kind of way, there's going to be an effect. If you're moody and you act some timing, there's going to be an effect. Don't complain about people not liking you when they have to figure out which one of you came to work today. There's going to be cause and effect. You don't like it, but I'm going to preach it until you get it. There's going to be cause and effect. If, you, if they didn't like you on your last job, and they didn't like you on this job, and they didn't like you on the job before, all them people can't be wrong. There's got to be cause and effect. And the reason we have this chaos is because of cause and effect. Sarah knew she wanted the cause, but she couldn't determine the effect. And now Hagar is operating as if she's something more than a maid because you asked me to do more than make up the bed. Once you open that door, you can't control what comes through it. You set yourself up in this situation. And now all of a sudden Sarai is freaking out and she is behaving badly toward Hagar only because Hagar was behaving badly toward her. This is what happens when boundaries come down. When boundaries come down, chaos is born. When boundaries come down, right? That, that, when boundaries come down, chaos is born. And all of a sudden, they lowered the boundaries of what was normal requirements, and now they got chaos. I'm going to preach this today. I'm going to preach this until somebody gets it. I'm going to preach it until a marriage is restored. I'm going to preach it until somebody sees a change on their job. I'm going to preach it until a family gets healed. I'm going to preach it until you and your old girlfriend get back together again. I'm going to preach it until you stop falling out with everybody everywhere, treating pe people badly and wondering why things are happening the way they're happening. You're treating them badly, but you started this. You started this. Why did you borrow the money if you wasn't going to pay it back? Now you got an attitude because I'm asking you for what is rightfully mine. You started this. You brought this on yourself. Why did you bring them in your house? Why did now nah, you upset because they drank up all the milk? They left the refrigerator. You brought them in the house. And Hager is on the run and she's trying to get away from Sarai. She's trying to get as far away as she can. She wants to get where Sarai's power can no longer treat her badly. She wants to get away from the jurisdiction of her abuser. Sometimes people talk about what you're running to and how fast you're running and how aggressive you are in your career. And they don't know that sometimes it's not about what you're running to. It's about what you're running from.
She's trying to get away from Sarai. She's trying to get as far from her as she can. And she went way out into the desert. And there she is out there in the desert. There she is pregnant in the desert. Pregnant in the desert, running from her mistress. And then the Bible said something that I want to share with you today. The Bible says the angel of the Lord found her. Good God Almighty. I don't care where you run. I don't care how many churches you change. I don't care how many states you move to. I don't even care how many countries you go to. You can't go anywhere where God can't find you. If you go in the strip club, he can find you. If you go in a house of ill repute, he can find you. If you go in a crack house, he can find you. If you join the witches, he can find you. I don't care where you go, God will always find you find you. The angel of the Lord found her. When God goes searching for you, he will find you. I know you like to say you found the Lord, but it's not true. You did not find the Lord because the Lord was never lost. You did not find the Lord. The Lord found you. Whatever you were doing, however you were doing, whoever you were doing it with, when God gets ready to find you, he can always find you. And the Bible said that the angel of the Lord found Hagar. Wait a minute, I want to thank him for being able to find me. He found me in my low estate. He found me in my depression. He found me in my fear. He found me in my happenstance. He found me in my chaos. He found me when my mother couldn't find me. He found me when my father couldn't find me. He found me when my wife couldn't find me. He found me when my sister couldn't find me. He found me when my brother couldn't find me. God can find you. He knows where you are. And then I got to stop it. I got to praise him for something else. That God would send an angel after a slave. I know why he found Jeremiah. Jeremiah was to be the weeping prophet. I know why he found Isaiah. Isaiah was to be the eagle eye prophet. I know why he found Daniel, because Daniel was going to be the prophet that taught us about eschatology. I know why he went on the hunt for so many others, but for God to go chasing after a slave. It must mean that this woman is more important than we think she is. I'm going to teach Bible class Wednesday night, and I'm going to show you some things that's really going to hook up with this message. So if you love this message, you're really going to love Wednesday night Bible class. He found her because she was carrying destiny. He found her because she was carrying legacy. See, he found her because she was pregnant with God's plan. He found her because she was pregnant with God's purpose. When you got legacy down in you, when you got destiny down inside, you may not have no money in your pocket. You may have holes in your shoe. You may have your hair all over your head, but it's not what's on you that matters. It's what's inside of you. God found her. He found her because she was carrying a part of God's plan and purpose and destiny. And he kept hunting till he found her. Do you not know that God is on the hunt for you? He's worse than the CIA. He's worse than the FBI. When God is on the hunt for you, he'll find you. It's not what's on you, it's what's inside of you. She might have been invisible to everybody else, but she was important to God because God knew that there was a purpose even in Sarai's foolishness. Only God can take bad mistakes and make them work out for good. Only God can take bad choices and make them end up fitting into his plan. We know, for we know, Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord. I feel like preaching this morning. I said all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord. The thing might not have been good, but God will work it for good. The thing might have been foolish, but God will work it for good. The thing might have been crazy, but God will work it for good. God was working on their behalf, and they didn't even know it. And there Sarai is. She's, she's on the runaway. She's a runaway slave. 
She's a runaway slave, running away from Sarai, running away from the situation, running away from pain, running away from problems, running away from situations. You can't run away from problems. If you run away from problems, they'll always catch up with you. God found her. He found her. Stop running. Yeah, stop running. Make a note to yourself to stop running. Make a note to yourself to face reality. Make a note to yourself that you cannot cure what you will not confront. Stop running. Stop running. I don't care how they threaten you. I don't care how much they intimidate you. I don't care what they say about you. I don't care how they threaten you. You might as well stand up and face it like a grown woman. You might as well stand up and face it like a grown man because you'll never succeed running away from what you got to confront. God found her. She had to be important for God to search her out. She had to be somebody for God to go on the hunt for her. She had to be somebody for God to look her up. She had to be somebody for God to send an angel and say, don't stop flying until you find her. And the Bible said that the angel of the Lord found Hagar and said, Hagar, what are you doing here? I want to talk to somebody. I want to ask you a question. What are you doing here? Knowing what you know, having experienced what you have experienced, what are you doing in this desert? How did you get to this dry place? How did you get to this place of giving up your prayer life and your consecration? What are you doing here that you have reduced yourself down to this level? You know you were not made to be in no desert. You know that, that your provision is not in there. What are you doing here? And she says, well, she looks at the angel and said, I was running away from my mistress. And then the angel delivers this message. He says, I want you to go back to what you were running from. Now that is a scary thing. If I was scared enough to run, now you want me to go back to the very thing I was running from. You might as well face it. You might as well stand up to it. It is what it is. It's going to do what it's going to do. And it's going to be what it's going to be. You might as well turn around and go back to it. You can't spend the rest of your life running from everything that is uncomfortable. I want to talk to somebody who spent all of your life running from everything that was uncomfortable. As soon as the job got hard, you quit. As soon as the situation got tough, you gave up. As soon as the business got difficult, you gave in. As soon as the marriage ran into conflict, you gave up. You have been running from stuff all of your life. And your takeaway word this Sunday morning is stop running. If I stop right here and don't preach another word, your word from the Lord is stop running. You've gone far enough. There's nothing in that desert for you. And God said, stop running. If you keep on running, you'll never be anybody. If you keep on running, you'll never discover your purpose. If you keep on running, you'll never find out who you are in God. If you keep on running, you'll never understand what you got down inside of you. If you keep on running, you'll always have low self-esteem. If you keep on running, you'll never become what God meant for you to be. Stop running. Stand still. See the salvation of the Lord. Stand right here and steady yourself. Having done all to stand. Stand therefore with your loins girt about with truth. Broaden your shoulders, strengthen your neck, get your head ready and say it is what it is. And the angel spoke to her and said, stop running. I've never seen a man respect himself if he always ran away. This is past how Sarai feels about you. This is past how Abram feels about you. I'm talking about how you feel about yourself. 
You'll never respect yourself if you keep quitting. Do you not know that God said, I will heal you from backsliding? I didn't even know backsliding was a disease. God said, I will heal you from backsliding. I will heal you from running. I will heal you from giving up. I will heal you from quitting. I will heal you from stopping. I will heal you of always living in almost. I almost did it. I almost finished school. I almost got a degree. I almost bought a house. I almost got married. I almost had a friend. I almost, God said, I will heal you from backsliding. I will heal you from giving up. Incidentally, the word backsliding isn't just going back. It's really sitting down. Whenever the mule would get stubborn and sit down, his back would be at an angle, and they call it backsliding. Anytime you sit down on your purpose, anytime you sit down on your destiny, anytime you sit down in a desert and get ready to die, the desert isn't killing you. It's you sitting down that's killing you. And the angel told her, stop running. I want you to go back to your mistress. Now in my mind, in my mind, in my crazy way of thinking, if, if the angel would have come to me and told me to go back to the very person that I had been running from, I would have been nervous and I would have been upset and I would have been afraid and I would have been uncomfortable, and I would have had anxiety, and I would have had problems, and I would have had nervousness, and I would have, I would have, I would have had some a trepidation about uh, coming back into this situation again. But instead of being afraid, she got happy. She got happy in the desert. Oh, wait a minute. I want to talk about happy in the desert. She got happy in the desert. You don't have to wait till you get to the mansion. You can get happy in the desert. You don't have to wait till all your bills are paid. You can get happy in the desert. The best praise God ever got was a sacrifice of praise. I dare you to praise him in the middle of your trouble. I dare you to praise him in the middle of your problem. I dare you to praise him in the middle of your storm. I dare you to praise him when you're up under attack. I dare you to praise him while you're waiting on the answer to come. I dare you to praise him in the middle of your dilemma. I dare you to praise him without knowing how things are going in. To stand right still in the middle of the desert and say, I'm going to praise you right out here in the middle of the desert. There ain't no praise like a desert praise. Oh, I wish I had some people that were watching me this morning that would give God a desert praise. I don't have no money, but I got a praise. I'm running out of food, but I got to praise. I don't have no job, but I got to praise. I'm going through a crisis, but I got to praise. See, the devil wants you to cry in the desert, but Hagar got happy in the desert and began to praise her God. Somebody take a minute and give God a praise in the middle of your desert. I'm praising you. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm praising you. I don't know what she's going to say, but I'm praising you. I don't know what I have to go through, but I'm praising you right in the middle of my desert. Hell gets nervous when you praise God in the middle of the desert. Demons tremble when you praise God in the middle of your desert. Praise him in your living room. Praise him at your kitchen table. Let everything that have breath praise ye the Lord. There she is praising God in the middle of the desert. God always uses people that can praise him without a crowd. Anybody can praise him in a crowd. Anybody can praise him in a bit of noise. Anybody can praise him with a lot of great music. But God is looking for somebody who can praise him in isolation. God is looking for somebody who can praise him without an amen. God is looking for somebody that can praise him all by yourself. 
And she wasn't just praising him just to be praising him. She wasn't just praising him because she took a class on five steps to a quick praise. She wasn't just praising him because she read a book on the power of praise. She wasn't just praising him because she knew the, the Hebrew words for praise. She was praising him because she said, Elroy, Elroy, Elroy is a word you might not be familiar with. It is a Hebrew word that means God sees. For somebody who's never been seen. For somebody who's always been overlooked. For somebody who's never been regarded. For somebody who's never had a chance. For somebody that everybody walked past. For somebody that thought your time would never come. There's a joy when you think about it. God sees me. There she is in the desert. She hadn't eaten yet. <laughs> there she is in the desert, and yet she's praising God just because he sees her. The Lord sent me here to tell you this Sunday morning, I see you. I see you. I see you. I know you don't have any money, but I see you. I know you don't have no title, but I see you. I know you've been through a, a lot of haters, but I see you. I know you've made some bad mistakes, but God said, I see you. Do you know what it is to get God's attention? To know that God is mindful of me. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visited him? God wants you to know, I see you. Abram might not see you. Sarai may not see you. Your circumstances may not honor you. But God sees you. She said, Elroy, oh, Elroy, <laughs> Elroy, I want you to write that down, Elroy. I want you to put it on your computer, Elroy. I want you to add it into your praise language, Elroy. Elroy. Devil, you can't do whatever you want to do because Elroy. Enemy, you cannot have my body because Elroy. I will not be a skeleton because Elroy. I will not be a carcass in the desert because of Elroy. The buzzards will not eat up my flesh because of Elroy. I will not come to a negative end because of Elroy. I will not die in my desert because of Elroy. Somebody's in a desert right now and the devil's been telling you this is all you are, this is what you deserve, this is all you're ever going to be. Where you are, as far as you go get, your mama never got nowhere, your daddy never got anywhere, and you're not going to get anywhere, but you put your hands on your hips and look the devil right in the face and say, Elroy, <laughs> yes, Elroy, God sees right where I am. God knows right where I am. God knows what I'm going through. God sees how I feel. God sees what's happening in my life. God, God sees me. God sees me. God sees me. God sees me. She threw her hands up and said, Elroy, God sees me. I must be somebody. <laughs> Ow! I must be somebody. Elroy, I must have some value. Elroy, I must have a purpose. Elroy, I must be in the plan. Elroy, Elroy, God sees me. Shall yes, shall yes, shall yes, shall yes. Yeah! Uh.
Elroy, Elroy, working a part-time job, but Elroy, flipping burgers at a burger shop, but Elroy, living off of unemployment, but Elroy, body is racked with pain, but Elroy, work double shifts for two weeks, but Elroy, Husband walked out the door, but Elroy, he, wife don't care nothing about me, but Elroy, he, God, 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 God sees you. He sees you. He sees what's in you. He sees what you shall be. And they begin to prophesy to that old girl. And they told her, you're going to bring forth a child. His name shall be called Ishmael. Said he will be a wild man. His hand shall be against all men. And all men shall be against him. But out of him shall come a great nation. How can greatness come out of weakness? How can greatness come out of despair? How can greatness come out of disappointment? How can greatness come out of heartache? I'll tell you how. Elroy, if God sees him, they might mean it for evil, but he'll make it work out good. If God sees you, you might be in a weak place, but God will bring greatness out of your life. Elroy, he, that's what I want you to understand. That's what I want you to, that's what I want you to, that's what I want you to, that's what I want you, that's what I want you, that's what I, that's what I, that's what I, I want you to understand. He sits high, but he looks down low. He's got all power in his hand. And he sent me to tell you that he sees you. Now she's on her way back. Good God Almighty. The woman who was running this way has had an encounter with God that made her do a 180. I feel a turnaround. Somebody ought to do a 180 right in your house. God's about to turn some things around. What you was running from, you're getting ready to run to. God's going to do a 180. You don't want a 360, because a 360 will take you back where you were. You need a 180. God's going to give you a complete turnaround. And here comes Hagar back down the road. The angel told her, there is no provision for you in the run. The provision is in the fight. Ah, there is no provision for you on the run. The provision is in the fight. Stop running from the fight and turn around and go back home because I have put your provisions in the house of Sarai. That's why the enemy's trying to run you out. Because your provisions are right there. And it's only a matter of time until you see God provide for you. But the problem is, you have gotten out of place. You left it because it was tough. You left it because it was hard. You left it because it hurt your feelings. You left it because you weren't recognized. You left it because you weren't appreciated. You left it because it got difficult. You left it because it was complicated. You left it because it wasn't easy. You left it because it hurt your feelings. You left it because it made you cry. But what you don't understand is that God is providing for you in trouble. <laughs> you didn't hear me. God is providing for you in trouble. The Bible said that God is a present help in trouble. If you run from the trouble, you're running from God. 
If you run from the trouble, you're running from your provisions. Because God puts your provisions in a place of trouble and discomfort and distress. God puts your promised land behind the walls of Jericho. God puts your blessing in the hands of somebody who has lost appreciation for you. And even though the atmosphere does not feel anointed, <laughs> even though the atmosphere does not feel conducive, even though the atmosphere does not feel convenient, even though the atmosphere is not what you had in mind, God said, I put your bread there. I put your water there. I put your blessing there. And you're never going to get what I provided for you until you go back to the place of discomfort. The place of discomfort is your growing place. The place of discomfort is your strengthening place. The place of discomfort is your place of provision. When Abraham carried Isaac up on the Mount Moriah, and he said, Jehovah Jireh, it was in a place of discomfort that he discovered his provision. God will provide the ram, but you got to come with the sacrifice. Until you are willing to raise your knife up and slay your flesh, you will not see the provision of God. What do you mean slay your, slay your pride? Slay your arrogance? Slay the fact that you are used to being spoiled and pampered and getting your way. And God said, turn around and go back. The God, El Royhi, who sees you, wants you to go back to the woman who acts like she don't. And hey, is happy to go where she was once running from only because she, she not because she thought Sarai was going to change not because she thought Sarai was going to have a change of heart God did not promise her that but she was happy because now she knew El Roy God sees me and if God sees me, I can deal with you not seeing me. I can deal with you walking past me. I can deal with you ignoring me. I can deal with you turning. If God sees me, I can deal with your snide remarks. I can deal with your haterade. If God sees me, I can deal with you snubbing me. I can deal with you making my job harder than it ought to be. If God sees me, all I need to know is, oh, all I need to know is El Roy. El Roy. God sees me. El Roy. God sees me. I got a lump in my breast. But El Roy. God sees me. I've had blood in my stool. But El Roy. God sees me. I'm not getting paid what I ought to be paid. But El Roy, God sees me. Go back to Sarah's house. Can you imagine what it was like for Hagar to walk back to where she was running from and knock at the door? Who is it? Uh, it's me. Me who? Hagar. What are you doing back here? Elroy. God sent me back. And I'm, what, what, what needs to be done? What needs to be fixed? What needs to be cooked? Whose beds need to be made? I am going to stay where he put me because El Roy, God sees me. And the Bible said that she conceived 
and brought forth Ishmael. And the slave woman got to live in the master's house. The slave woman slept in the master's bed. The slave woman got to birth the master's child. The slave woman got to raise her son. The early formative years of his life, not only in the house of his father, but in the house of the father of faith. Ishmael, Ishatai, Ishmael, the slave woman got to stay there all the years that Sarah still had no child. She got to raise, Hagar got to raise her child off of Sarah's money. The wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. And if you just humble yourself, God will put your provisions in the hands of your enemies and he will make your enemy your footstool. If she hadn't gone back, she'd have had to raise her baby in the desert. Instead, she raised him off of fresh milk and a warm bed and a place to stay. And she was able to do it with dignity because El Roy, God sees me. This Sunday morning, I don't know who I'm talking to, but the Lord wants you to know that he sees you. He has not forgotten you, your labor of love how you have ministered to the saints. God said, I see you. I see you. Dry your face. Wipe your eyes. Lift up your head, O ye gates. Be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors. God sees you. You do matter. You might be listening at me behind a prison wall right now, but God, God sees you. You might have tested positive for COVID-19, but God, God sees you. And that's all that matters. He sees you, and he's got a plan for your life. He sees you, and he's about to open up a door for you to step into a place that you didn't pay for. He sees you, and he's about to allow your children to have an experience that they would have never had if you'd have stayed in that desert. God sees you. And I know it's not perfect, and I know it's complicated, and I know it's got problems, and I know it hurts your feelings. But God has prepared a table before you in the presence of your enemies. And he has anointed your head with oil. And I swear to you, your cup is going to run over. And the Lord wanted me to tell you, I see you. I see you tossing and turning in the bed at night. I see you walking the floor at one and two o'clock in the morning. I see when you, when you turn over and hug the pillow and the tears run across your eyes, your husband don't see you. God said, I, 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 I see you. I see you standing in the shower crying and, and, and you can't tell the water from the tears. And she don't even know you crying, but God, God told me to tell you. He sees you. You have to make yourself get in the car and go to work. Things are going so bad, you don't even want to deal with it. 
God sees you. Little girl, I know you've been fondled. You feel dirty and worthless, but you're wrong. Come out of your desert and lift your hands and praise him because El Roy. God sees you. Well, if the Lord saw me, why would he let it happen? Because even though it was bad, you're not bad. And God's going to take good things and bring them out of your life in spite of the bad things that happen in your life. There's something in you. Elroy. I think you ought to lift your hands right where you are and just open your mouth and begin to, and just begin to worship him. Do you not know you're worshiping him with his eye on you right now? With his gaze upon you. With him looking at your situation right now. If you lift your hands and open your mouth, God sees you right where you are. Open your mouth and give God the praise. Just a holy praise. Just a thank you praise. Just a praise of appreciation. God sees you. Oh, I am not forgotten. I am not rejected. I am not an outcast. I must be somebody. I gotta be somebody. He proved I was somebody. He sent his angel to find me in my desert. God sees. He sees me. Elroy. Elroy. I'm almost finished, but Elroy. Right in that house. Elroy. Right in that situation. Elroy. Can't you see Hager? Making up the bed and singing. Elroy. Elroy. Oh. Elroy, Elroy, what are you making that noise about? Oh, excuse me, Elroy, Elroy, sing unto the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things, his right hand and his holy arm. It got me, it got me, it got me, it got me, it got me the victory, it got me the victory. God sees me. God sees me. God sees you. He's got provisions for you. All you got to do is go back and get them. The way is already made. He got the next 12 years of your life covered without any of your expense. But you won't get that if you stay in the desert. The desert of depression, the desert of fear, the desert of frustration, the desert of bitterness, the desert of anger, the desert of depravity, the desert of deserting your posts. Elroy. God sees you. And it don't matter who don't. And it don't matter who won't. And it don't matter who can't. Ah! God sees you. I know about the bills and I know about the problems and I know about the tumor and I know about the lump 
and I know about the mistake, and I know about the affair, and I know about the crisis, I know God sees you. That ought to be enough. God sees you. That ought to make you raise your head up. God sees you. That ought to put clapping back in your hands. God sees you. That ought to put joy down in your soul. Elroy, 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 God sees me. He sees my unborn child. He sees the promises that haven't happened in my life yet. He sees the business that I'm going to start next year. <laughs> he sees the books I'm going to write. He sees the songs I'm going to sing. He sees the position that I haven't even gotten yet. I'm just pregnant with it. It hadn't happened yet, but God sees it. So I close this message. You can forget me, it doesn't matter. You can forget the name of the church, it doesn't matter. But don't you forget Elroy. 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 God sees you. I want to pray for people who have felt invisible. I want to pray for wives who felt invisible. I want to pray for husbands who get up and go and go and get up and go and get up and go, but deep down you feel invisible. I want to pray for single people who feel invisible. I want to pray for raped people who feel invisible. I want to pray for drug addicts who feel invisible. I want to pray for ex-felons and criminals who feel invisible. I want to pray for sick people who feel invisible, incapacitated people who feel invisible, special needs people who feel invisible, homeless people who feel invisible. Working people who feel invisible. You do all the work, they get all the credit. You feel invisible. I want to pray for you right now. I want to pray for people who have tangible things, but emotionally you're bankrupt. I want to pray for people who got a nice car in the driveway, but no love in your life and you feel empty and frustrated. The Lord told me, Elroy, I see you. I see you and I care about what you're going through. And I saw every tear coming down your face and I am your God and you are my people, Elroy. And I won't close this service until you do a 180 in that desert, until you do a 180 on that depression and that anger and that bitter tongue you got and that hot head you got and that temper ain't nothing but pain coming out of your mouth. Because you never felt special. You were never the one. You weren't the special kid. You weren't the favorite kid. You were never the bride, always the bridesmaid, always close, always almost, never got there. This is your message today. Elroy, can I pray with you today? Father, in the name of Jesus, I lift up the invisible. I lift up the abandoned, the forsaken, the rejected, the ostracized. I lift up the desert people who have been in such a such a dry place. <sighs> Such a dry place. They got all kind of stuff, but they're in a dry, dry place. And this is the message that's going to change their lives. This is the launching pad. This is the prayer that's going to destroy the yoke. 
Lord, send the buzzards back home. They will not die in this wilderness. Send the buzzards to flight. Bye. You will not devour me in the middle of my vulnerability. You will not eat me up because of my circumstance and my situation. Because now I know El Roy, he sees me. Give them the joy and the peace and the power they need to overcome every obstacle. And if there's one out there that doesn't know you, I pray that right now they come to know you and the free pardon of their sins. That they would invite you into their heart right now and allow you to take residence in their lives. And I pray that you give them the courage to stand up to life. To stand up to their responsibilities. To finish the job you started in their life whether they're honored or not, or recognized or not, or appreciated or not, or affirmed or not, or liked or not, I pray in the name of Jesus that every Hagar listening to me out there right now, every abandoned, forsaken, rejected, ostracized, criticized, alienated individual would get up out of that wilderness and turn around and head back home. In the name of Jesus, we pray. For the next 60 seconds, I want you to give him the best praise you ever gave him in all of your life. Out of your mouth and out of your belly and out of your spirit, I want you to open up and give God the praise right where you are and just begin to thank him and just begin to adore him. And just, yes, like that, yeah, like that. Yeah, like that, like that with holy hands, without, without fear, without doubt, without compromise. the potter's house, the place where broken vessels get healed, where wounded vessels get restored, where lame bones get reset, where broken hearts get mended, where blinded eyes come open. We are the potter's house, the place of El Roy the place where God sees you, the place where God understands you, the place where you get the courage every Sunday to go back Monday and face whatever you got to face, because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I'm Bishop T.D. Jakes, senior pastor of the Potter's House, and I approve this message. God bless you.